Hello everyone and welcome to Silverfort's webinar series, Why Identity is a Crucial Component of Zero Trust Security. In part two of our series, our guest speaker, Forrester's former VP and Principal Analyst, Dr. Chase Cunningham, and Silverfort's CEO and co-founder, Head Kovitz, will discuss the importance of risk analysis and adaptive policies in Zero Trust Security. If you missed the first part of our series, Why Unified IEM Visibility and Control is Key for Zero Trust Security, make sure to check it out. Welcome, Chase. It's great to have you. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to cover basically uh, a, a pretty key point here is that this is not as complex as you probably have thought. A lot of folks will, during you know workshops and whatnot, will say, Zero Trust sounds like a huge thing. I don't understand how to apply this. This is a concept which is uh you know more theory than, than applicability and etc and, and in reality I, I get why they had that argument but it's really not that difficult when you boil it down to a very simple approach and and i'll walk you through that here if you take away all the other stuff around zt it's really three very simple principles i always want to verify explicitly i always want to use least privilege access and i always want to assume breach everything is compromised until proven otherwise if i approach Everything that I do from those three things, which is the basis, the very, very basis of what Zero Trust says, then you're enabling ZT in some way, shape, or form. Now, there are many ways to do this. There are different avenues of leveraging technology to enable this. But at the end of the day, if you go through all the research and all the history and all the other stuff around ZT, this is what you're doing. And I'll show you how this can be applied. Let's go to the next slide. So zero trust it basically is very much a, a, an approach for business, right? And let's think about how business works today. Let's think about what has to happen for us to continue to do things in a perimeterless or outside of an enterprise boundary sort of world. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, uh, unless you've got some you know very tangential use case of a robot or something like that, mostly it's people, AKA humans needing access to resources. So people use resources that resource may be cloud stuff. It may be PaaS, IaaS, on-prem, off-prem, email, Zoom, uh, Excel, whatever you want to call it. But somehow or another, people are accessing resources. Next slide. How do people get to resources? They get to resources with a device. Just like right now, I'm on a Zoom doing this webinar. The way that I get there is I use my Microsoft Surface, which gets me to the cloud, which has Zoom running on it. So people on devices get to that resource. Next slide. And the way that we do that is we use a network. So people on devices use networks to get the resources. And if we continue to walk through this, we understand how this is starting to break out. You probably see where I'm going with this. People use devices on a network to get to a resources. This is the flow. This is how things work in cyberspace. And this is how things work in IT as it stands today. Now, what we have to do is apply a zero trust capability to make this more secure and do it in a way that does not interrupt the user interaction and user usability of this whole thing. We don't want people being miserable as they're on a device who don't like using the network to get to a resource that is so restricted that they can't actually use it. We want it to just be People on devices use networks to get the resources. The way that we do that is with this next magical piece of infrastructure that I think is where the core of future state ZT actually relies. Click, uh, click again, please. And that's the policy engine. So you have people on devices using networks to get to resources. The zero trust policy engine is what's sitting in there and chewing on all the information to correlate this stuff. And what it does is it takes in context from people on devices using network to get the resources and it applies a control. And this is the crux of what is really going on in a ZT uh, instance as, as it stands today. And I think this is where it's gonna be in the near future. This is what happens so that we know that that person is on this device, which is secure, patched, upgraded, whatever, and is on a network, that network we may not own, especially in the post COVID world, it's probably an ISP to go to a resource that may be in some location, which is cloud, off-prem, on-prem, IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, whatever. But this is what happens is that zero trust policy looks at all that context and it applies a control to do something. Click again. And we do that with intelligence and automation. The point here being, we can't do this one-to-one. -one. I can't do this on a spreadsheet. I can't do it with an Excel file. I can't do this manually with one person in a SOC approving everything as it comes in all the time. 
It has to be done in an intelligent and automated fashion, especially when you think about all the information, all the users, all the devices, the disparate nature of networks and all the resources that they might be going to. This cannot be done in an manual fashion. This has to be automated and it has to be done intelligently. Click again. The scope of this can be pretty broad and this is not all inclusive, but I'm just gonna run through some samples to kind of bound what we're talking about here. People might be an employee, might be a third party partner, could be a customer, could be a vendor. And actually I learned this year, could be a robot. It could basically be anything that has an identity and click again on their device, which might be a laptop, a desktop, a phone, tablet, server, IOT, web enabled coffee maker, whatever on a network which may be public, might be private, could be managed, could be unmanaged, could be a Tor network, could be botnet, whatever, to get to a resource, which could be on-prem, off-prem, SAS, PaaS, IaaS, whatever. And we do that with this approach, which is we verify. And again, this is not all inclusive. This is just sampling the role, the task, the type, the device. We look at whether it's managed, unmanaged, joined, patched, unpatched, the network, is it corp, geo, familiar, anonymized? Is it an attacking network? Is it a botnet to go to the resource, which maybe it has publication information, maybe it has classification and tagging of the data, could be sensitivity applied there. And we use context from that information, risk, threat intelligence, habits, science, time anomalies, and then we apply a control, block, auth, uh, authentication, step up, audit, encrypt, accept those terms, whatever. But this is the, re the totality of what you do and again, not all inclusive, there's lots of other things that can be applied here, but this is how that works. People on devices using networks to get to resources, context is taken and chewed up by the policy engine and a control is applied. And go on to the next slide. And what we do at all times is we make sure that we secure the data. The data is what's going through this system. That's what people are trying to get to on that resource. This is how we make sure that we control what's going on, which would cause a problem. Data is the, the gold, data is what the bad guys are after in a really, simple version, you know, like let's take it just an everyday scenario, an FTE on a domain joined machine wants to access email, there's no additional risk. The thing that we do, the control we require is we step up MFA. And you can see that right here as we click through this. The FTE is on a domain joined device. They're on a network that is off corporate net to go to their email. What do we do because there's no anomalies? We apply MFA. Like that is literally as simple as it can be when you talk about applying zero trust in a, per, in a context of people on devices using networks to get to resources. And this is something everybody can understand. We all do this all day, every day. It is applicable. It makes sense. And yes, you can go down a whole bunch of rabbit holes and there are ways to make this way more complex. But the argument about this is too hard to do. This is not achievable. This is something that is way beyond the average enterprise. Doesn't hold water. This is zero trust applied in the context of business that everyone can understand and see what goes where in this particular model. Thanks, Chase. I think this was very interesting. I definitely agree with what you just said about, uh, you know, this looking a bit too complex for some companies because you need to take all this data, build the policies around it. And, and yeah, you can start with something simple like this. I think it's a great way to get started. Um, I do think that you can take it to the next level and actually leverage all these data without the complexity of building the policies by using adaptive risk-based policies. And you definitely need a, a solution that can do that and look at all this data and correlate it and make those real-time decisions to make it simpler for the, the, the company that is using it. And that's what we'll talk about now, but just before that, a short recap of what we discussed on the last webinar and, and the approach that Silverport is taking for unified uh, identity-based zero trust. So just as a quick reminder, today many companies have all these different identity platforms, uh, one for cloud, one for on-premise, one for the perimeter and so on, and each of them only sees part of the picture. So trying to use the data that you have only for your web applications or only at the perimeter is just not enough to achieve what uh, we're talking about today. And Silverport is connecting to all these different identity stores and looking at all the things that they all see together so that we can correlate the behavior, we can take all this data, and we can understand what is actually risky.
and what policies we need to enforce in different situations. So today, let's dive a little bit deeper into the actual risk engine. Uh, the advantage of Silverfold's architecture is that because it's agentless and proxyless, we can see all these different things different devices and servers and applications and infrastructure, and who is accessing them, humans, machines, uh, privileged users, uh, non-privileged, and so on. And because of that, we just have more data than what you would get with uh, a specific solution sitting on the perimeter or just for your web applications or just for your privileged users or, um, you know, or just on one type of resources. And the way we leverage all this data is using three different uh, components or engines. One is anomaly detection. That's where we leverage machine learning to understand what is the typical behavior and access pattern of each user, each device, each group of users. And we can look for anomalies. We can see that this user is accessing resources that he doesn't normally access or maybe resources that no one from his group is even accessing. Uh, and that's where we can find things that you know, nobody really predicted, but they just look like anomalies versus the normal behavior of this specific organization. The second part is where we look for known attack patterns, things like lateral movement, ransomware, uh, brute force, password spray. These are things that sometimes you don't even need machine learning. To detect because if somebody is tying a lot of different passwords on one, one of your accounts, it's definitely a high risk, right? Um, and we can detect that from the first moment. And the third component is external risk indications. So if another security product or another system tells us that there is a risk from one of the devices or the users, we can take this into account in real time. So if the steam or the store solution is telling us that this device is a high risk, even if this is coming from another product, we want to leverage this data into our identity-based risk engine. Uh, so one example of how we use this on the anomaly side is the way we do graph analysis. We basically build a graph of all the different uh, access activities in the network. These users connect from these devices to these resources. And then on top of this graph, we run a lot of algorithms that we're using uh, that help us cluster communities. They help us uh, predict lateral movement or detect lateral movement. Uh, for example, if a user is trying to access a resource that you know, he or she never accessed before, that might be risky, but that happens every day, right? And we don't want to say that everything like this is a high risk. But if this is a resource that nobody from this community or this type of users is accessing, it's something that another group of users is typically accessing, that would be a higher risk because if someone from HR trying to access a resource that is typically accessed by finance team, right? So this would be a higher risk and we take this into account and it continues to learn. And by the way, this algorithm kind of trains itself because when we trigger step up authentication with this adaptive policy, the user actually tells us if we are right or wrong, right? If the user is able to prove his identity, that tells us that this was a false positive. Maybe next time we will look at this kind of behavior as a bit less risky as opposed to if the user failed the step up authentication, and then we know we were actually right. So now let's look at a very quick demo of how this works. Thanks, Chase. This was very interesting. Uh, I definitely agree with what you just said about how many companies find it too complex to build all these policies manually. And it is good to start simple sometimes, and MFA is definitely key here. But I do think that there is a way to achieve something more sophisticated using uh, adaptive risk-based policies. And as we talked on the last webinar, one of the challenges of analyzing all this in the organization in a, in a more holistic way is that many organizations have 
several different identity platforms, each of them seeing part of the picture. So just to recap that part, uh, this is what we see in a lot of organizations where you know, one identity solution is looking at cloud and one is looking at on-premise and one is looking at the perimeter and so on, each of them seeing only a small part of the picture. And that really prevents organizations from using all this data effectively to analyze risk. And what we're doing at Silverfort is connecting to all these different identity platforms, correlating what each of them is seeing, and getting the full picture of user access and activity across the different environments. By doing that, we get the ability to analyze risk across the board, across every user, every device, accessing any system in any environment. And this is where the risk engine really kicks in, because we can use all this data and we can use this agentless and proxyless architecture that is unique to Silverfort to understand what users are doing across the different situations and environments. We can use a few different engines here to analyze all this data, one of them being anomaly detection, where we use machine learning to understand what every user, every device, every community is doing, what they are accessing, what is normal and what is abnormal for them. The second component is looking for known threats like lateral movement, ransomware, brute force attacks, uh, password spray, all these different techniques that attackers are using that allow them to spread across the network. And, and we've seen a lot of these attacks recently, right? Where people were compromising these identities and then using them to take over the network uh, we can detect those things because we are looking at every single thing each of these users is accessing across the network and looking for all these patterns that look like identity-based attacks. And then the last component is external risk indications where we connect with other security products in the company, like your SIM, your SOAR, any other product that is looking for you know, risky users and devices and correlating data. And we can use this alerts and this data uh, is part of the risk analysis. So now just to give you an example of you know, one of the ways we machine learning here to detect anomalies, I'll talk a little bit about the risk analysis graph. This is where Silverfold is continuously building a graph of all the different access scenarios in the network. You know, these users connect from these devices to these resources. And on top of all this graph with all the data that is in it, we are running our algorithms, looking for uh, communities, looking for lateral movement patterns. And by doing that, we can really understand what users should be accessing and what they shouldn't be accessing and what looks like normal behavior versus an attack. Because it's not just looking at the perimeter or the cloud applications. This is a unified view and analysis of every access within the organization. So now to see how this actually works, let's go in, uh, into a short demo of the product. So let's start by looking at what happens when we try to run an actual attack tool in our network. So in this case, we will use Mimikatz to run a pass the hash attack. That's a lateral movement attack where we take the credentials of a user, in this case an admin, that are stored in the memory of this device, and we will use them to move laterally to another server as the admin. It's a very common attack technique. That's what a lot of malware and ransomware are using. And it's very difficult to stop because it's using PSExec, which no authentication solution actually protects. And with Silverfork, we can actually protect it. We can understand all these uh, behavior patterns. We can see that something looks suspicious, and we can trigger MFA or even block it. So in this case, we'll try to run Mimikatz. And I will get a push notification on my phone. Hopefully, you can hear that. And now I'm going to say no, because it's not me trying to access, or I will just ignore it, and it will time out. So once I click no, you will see that Mimikatz actually failed 
to perform the lateral movement. So now let's look at what happens within the server fault admin console after someone tries to run an attack like this. So now this is the server fault admin console. And we can see every access in the network being analyzed by Silverfold in here, coming from all the different identity providers in all the different protocols. And as we look at the insights, we will see that some users are risky right now. One of them being the admin account that we just tried to compromise. So when we investigate this user, we will see that indeed this user, you know, after being verified a few times successfully in the past, just tried to do something that triggered multi-factor authentication, which got uh, denied. So we only did it once in this demonstration, but as you can see, the malware actually kept trying behind the scenes. At this point, Silverfold already knew to block it. So we didn't even get additional MFAs just because Silverfold already knew this is probably a compromised account. We can also look at what are the risk indicators here, and there are plenty in this case, some of them being you know, more static, like you know, this user has a, an old password, it's a privileged user, a domain admin actually. Uh, but some of them are more risk-based uh, or more real-time uh, risk-based. Uh, for example, there's a suspected lateral movement here. So Silverfold identified that someone is trying to use a tool like Mimikatz to move laterally, basically taking the, the NTLM hash of this user and trying to move into another device. And we detected those patterns as lateral movement. So at this point, we knew that this user is a critical risk. And then it's really your decision, what do you want to happen? Do you want to trigger MFA? Do you want to block access, send you an alert? But kind of going back to what Chase talked about, you don't need to manually build all these small conditions because you can leverage this AI-driven risk engine to basically say, if the risk gets high or critical, I want to take a certain action. And we will use all of the data that we have to tell you what is high risk, what is a critical risk. So I think that's enough for this demo. And... You know, looking forward to talking more about some of these things in the next webinars. So thank you, Dr. Chase Cunningham. Thank you, Head Kovetz. Please stay tuned for our next webinar in which we will talk about how important it is to include service accounts in your uh, zero trust initiatives.